It's time to get inside the Giants huddle. Huddle up, huddle up, huddle up. On Giants.com. Here we go, here we go. And the Giants mobile Get them in there, let's go. Part of the Giants podcast network. Welcome to another edition of the Giants huddle podcast. John Schmelk with you. It's all brought to you by PSENG. Energy efficiency for game time and anytime. Visit PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. We're already only today, and we're joined by one of the busiest men this time of year. I'll say in the country, what the hell? He's Lance Zierlein. We only have him for 20 minutes. I don't want to list all his jobs because it might take up half the show, but he's been kind enough to give us a little bit of time tonight to talk some draft prospects here. Lance, hope you're well, man. Are you kind of ready for this thing to get going, or do you still have some hay some hay out of the barn? Oh, no, I still have some work. I mean, I still have – um let me see. I've got, I still got about 45 players to write up, but for me, that's like not a big deal. So, um, and these are guys, I'm just trying to figure out guys who could get drafted. If, if they get drafted, I have to have a scouting report. So um, right now I'm just digging around on, you know, I'm just trying to chase my ghost list basically and find uh, players who might end up getting drafted. So for me, my, my heavy lifting is done. It's different now. Now I'm doing a bunch of TV before I was writing up a bunch of draft profiles. Now it's more about, you know, it's more about doing the TV hits here and there. And, and uh, so it's a, a different kind of busy. Yeah. You can find all Lance's uh, scouting profiles on NFL.com. And then of course you can see him on NFL network on pretty much every show that's going on in the network at this time mm-hmm. of year. And I'm sure you're tired of talking about your most recent mock draft. So I promise you Lance, so this will be the only question I ask about it. Brian branch to the giants, which I personally think by the way is excellent value. What was your thinking mm-hmm. in giving branch to the giants at 25? <clears throat> well, I, I don't, um, you know, I don't address a team until I get to them in the process. And I try to think like each team would. I, I do some research on team needs. I'll take a look at some, you know, players at positions to see whose contracts are coming up. And, uh, I, you know, I do a little bit of work on that. Sometimes I'll call team sources uh, if I have a source on the team and just try to dig around. But they're, they're a little more tight-lipped now than they used to be <laughs> in terms of even getting – of even getting team needs, which used to be really easy. But um, so when I got to the Giants, <clears throat> you know, Brian Branch is a guy I like a lot, but it's funny because he is considered a safety, but he really played nickel the entire time at Al- for much of the time at Alabama. And people forget that he can play around the line of scrimmage. He can play back. He can play in the slot. I mean, when I, when I got down to the Giants, I was looking at wide receiver as a, a position and, and, um, you know, that I considered a little bit for the Giants, obviously. And I, I try to look at my best, my board of best available, um, how teams might look at this. I, and when I looked at the Giants, I mean, losing Julian Love, it's interesting. I thought Love was a good corner. I liked coming out of Notre Dame. I was surprised he was able to make the transition to safety. But when I look at Brian Branch, Brian Branch can do even, you know, Brian Branch has some of the talent Julian Love did, not, not the same speed. He's a little ste- a small step below speed wise, but I think he is a good cover man. He's very instinctive. He's always in the right place. He's very tough. He's a good tackler. Um, <clears throat> he can cover. I mean, he's just a good football player. He's rarely out of position. And as I mentioned, you can align him all over the field. So when I looked at, you know, when I looked at what the giants need and who they're playing, what, so ultimately a team needs to say, what do we need to do to win a Super Bowl? Well, the first thing is you got to win your division or try to win your division. Well, that just happens to be a pretty tough division. So with Dallas and, and obviously with, with uh, the Philadelphia Eagles. And so I thought, well, here's a guy who is smart. He's tough. He's dependable. He can match up with, you know, uh, tight ends in the, in the slot, like a, a Dallas Goddard type. He can match up uh, or he can play down near the line of scrimmage to help against the run, like against the Tony Pollard for example, or maybe spot, you know, do some, maybe not spying, but, you know, handle, handle his business in terms of keeping an eye on Jalen Hurts. He's just a very versatile player. And I thought he's uniquely suited to what the Giants are going to need in that division. Yeah. And, you know, Brian Day will get good intel on him from Nick Saban, given sure. his Alabama connections yeah. for sure. And there it is, Avery McKinney at safety. So we get the double Alabama back there too, which will work. You mentioned wide receiver was something you were looking at. And the reason I like to have mm-hmm. Lance on every year is that, he does his own work. He doesn't look at anybody mm-hmm. else's stuff. So he has his opinions, his grades on these guys, and he sticks to them and he has reasoning behind it. And sometimes they're different, mm-hmm. which I think is great because I think groupthink, Lance, as you know, kind of dominates his time of year. No one wants to be the outlier. 
and say, oh, I think right. this guy's a third round grade when everyone else has him as a one. But I think you do a great job of explaining what you think of group. So let's start wide receiver right. first, because you brought that up as, as a group you're looking at for the Giants. <clears throat> how do you see this kind of group of wide receivers in the first round and kind of how you stack them in terms of guys that could work for the Giants at 25 and potentially still be on the board? Sure. I, I think it's a, a difficult wide receiver group to to project in terms of where they go, because I don't think there's a true wide receiver one in this draft. I don't think I agree. when I say that, I just don't think there's a guy who's going to be a number one for any team. And, and not only do I not think that I'm pretty certain about that. Um, you got a guy who's really good at going vertical and Jalen Hyatt, but that's what he does. You can't ask him to do a lot more than that. I mean, so for certain teams, like I gave him to the chargers, I think it's a great fit for the chargers. I think it could be interesting in New York, but I don't, I don't love that fit for the giants. I, I do, you know, Jackson Smith and Jigba would be a really nice fit, but he's not going to be there at 25. Yep. And he's a guy who I think is going to be a good slot. Somebody who can be a high, um, a high target type of slot where Jalen Hyatt's going to be more like a Deshaun Jackson. You got Quentin Johnson who, you know, frankly, I'm, I'm a little nervous about him. I think the hands are suspect. He didn't run as fast as people thought the other day. I think he's playing fast on tape, but <clears throat> I question his consistency of competitiveness in game. And, and we saw some of that against Georgia. He just kind of just went away. And so that's a little bit of a concern, but he's really great after the catch. <clears throat> now he could be there for the Giants, and I think he would be in consideration for the Giants. Um, Josh Downs, you know, I would, if I had to stack them, I would say probably right now, Jackson Smith and Jigba is the safest guy more than likely based on who he is and what he does. But I think Zay Flowers is right there as well from Boston college. And that's another guy. If you hadn't taken Wandale Robinson, yep. I think that, you know, for me, that would be a really good pick if he was there. And if he wasn't there, then Josh Downs, Josh Downs is a, is a wide receiver that I'm very high on out of North Carolina. So 171 pounds. Uh, he's a 4440 guy, extremely confident. He he runs, you know, interestingly enough, one of my comps on him is Kadarius Tony, but in the sense that Kadarius, you know, was kind of a freestyle route runner, but he had basketball athleticism, and that's what Josh Downs from from uh North Carolina has. Just kind of a, a very natural pass catcher and just basketball athleticism where it's not rigid, it's not predictable, it is just the smooth, free-flowing uh, movements around the field. So I'm a big fan of his, of Zay Flowers, who's incredibly confident and sticky-handed. Um, but those guys are a little bit smaller. Uh, uh, Jordan Addison. I like Jordan Addison fine. I think he's a solid slot. He, once again, is in the 170s. So he's not a big guy either. So you have an unusual amount of smaller wide receivers or lighter wide receivers who some can play inside-outside, but typically they're going to – you know, be, be looked at more as, as outside receiver or inside receivers. So when you talk about the giants needs, I think Quentin Johnston, Quentin Johnston is one guy that you could see in consideration if he falls there, which I do think is possible. I think he could end up where the giants are when they pick. But as I look through everything, I just think that the better value is, is taking a good corner, taking a linebacker like a Drew Sanders, and then maybe looking at wide receiver in the second or third round, because I do think there's some some pretty good value with, with wide receiver position on day two. I don't think you look at day one and say, boy, these guys are really, really good. These are tier one guys, and then there's a big fall off. I still think you can pick and choose, and if you, you, know, if you do your evaluation, if you evaluate properly and, and you know what you're looking at as the Giants and you find exactly what fits your offense, I think you can maybe find some help in, in the second or third round. Well, well, let's talk about that. It's guys that you could get in the second and third round if one of those guys don't fit in round one. And I want to circle back to Quentin Johnson when we're done with this answer. I have another follow-up on you for that. You know, I think there are some bigger guys. You're talking, you know, Cedric Tillman, I think is kind of like a big possession guy. I really like A.T. Perry. I think he's a bigger guy that can, you know, I think he tracks the ball really well down the field, for example. Um, who are some of the other guys you might like on day two that – wouldn't be those kind of slot guys, which, you know, you mentioned Wanda Robinson. They also have Sterling Shepard. They also have Paris Campbell. They also have uh, Jamison Crowder. So guys that you think can play outside a little bit. Well, number one, I think you really hit it right on the head. Cedric Tillman's one of my favorite guys. And I think Cedric Tillman for me 
would be somebody I would consider for the Giants at 25 personally. I've got him sneaking in the back end of the first round. A lot of people don't realize how dominant he was at times in 2021 with a lesser version of Hendon Hooker. He put 200 yards on Georgia and then 152 on Alabama. And these are the two teams that played for the national championship. And people sleep on him a little bit because, you know, he played with a high ankle sprain. He had a surgery, the tightrope surgery, just so he could get back on the field. So he played at not even close to being 100%. And Jalen Hyatt got a lot of the, the attention. But the guy who's really more of the NFL, you know, wide receiver that people are really going to be looking at in the future, I think is going to end up being Cedric Tillman. But we've got to see how, you know, how the ankle holds up. But I think that's not going to be much of a problem. Marvin Mims is a wide receiver who he's not big, five foot eleven, but man, he can really run. And I think he's a guy that can play outside for the Giants, has a lot of vertical potential and capabilities. You mentioned A.T. Perry. He's 100 percent a guy that I would look at uh, on day two. Jonathan Mingo, man, I'm a Jonathan Mingo fan. I think Jonathan Mingo is big wide receiver out of out of uh, Ole Miss. It's hard not to look at him and start thinking about A.J. Brown because they're kind of similarly built and similarly competitive. And so Mingo is a guy, he doesn't have, you know, great play speed, but he is a good contested catch winner, which is what you want to see. And he can work from the slot as well. So if you wanted to get big from the slot, you could get big with him. So those are, you know, and then Elijah, Elijah um, Huggins from, from Stanford, who is, or Elijah Higgins from Stanford. He's a wide receiver, but he's 230 pounds. So what he is, is he's a big slot, a.k.a. pass-catching tight end. <laughs> Once you get to a certain size you and a certain physicality, they can call you a pass-catching slot, basically a big slot. And that's what he is. And I think he's a player that could be there in round four that could end up being um, a little bit of a, a, a surprise. I mean, I, was a, I liked Isaiah Hodgins coming out of Oregon State because he was such a competitive player catch guy he was just really had tremendous ball skills did not have the best um pure speed and separation and acceleration but just really knew how to play football just really understood how to how to attack the football and I think uh I think Higgins has some of that same stuff out of Stanford even though he's not getting a lot of attention yeah I'll throw his I'll throw his uh teammate white Michael Wilson out there too as a big Mm -hmm. wide out as long as yeah and 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 Michael Wilson's got to stay healthy yeah but he's also a great special teams player really terrific gunner so that's going to help his his draft value quick follow-up on Quentin Johnson then we had a couple more positions with you here Lance you know he's a weird Mm -hmm. guy to me you know you figure long kind of fast you know tall skinny (laughs) receiver he should be this really good contested catch guy but you don't see that, mm-hmm. but then he's the tall, skinny guy, but he's really good after the catch, which is usually not the prototypical guy. He's just a, his strengths and weaknesses for what his size is, is just very odd. And I wonder how teams are going to kind of calculate that in their heads when they figure out when they want to draft him. You know, that's a really good point. It's something I hadn't really considered because, so I like to, <clears throat> I like to take um, skill sets outside of this sport and apply them to other sports. Uh, or take other sports and apply them to football when I get a chance to, because I think it helps you in terms of context, really contextualize and understand um, what it is you're looking at. So for example, rebounding is, is a desire. Rebounding is about positioning. It's about putting a body on somebody. It's about understanding the angle of the ball coming off the rim and having some instincts. And then it's about just competitiveness. That's what contested catch is. It's nothing more to me. I always look for wide receivers and tight ends with basketball backgrounds because those guys have a natural instinct for where to put you on their hip and then how to go out and get the ball, whether it's high point or out in front of. And when I watch Quentin Johnson, I don't see a a really competitive player from a contested catch standpoint. I don't see that, you know, when the ball's up, this is mine. I'm going to get this. This is my ball. I see it from Zay Flowers. I see it from Jackson Smith and Jigba. And to me, that is a really critical Honestly, that is just a critical, critical trait for wide receiver success, in my opinion. Unless you have just terrific speed, then that kind of nullifies the contested catch concerns. But, you know, you're right. But you also make a great point in that he is really competitive after the catch, which is also, you know, that that is a competitive trait. Being being physical, being aggressive, trying to squeeze out every yard you can get. A guy like Jalen Hyde, for example – is almost the zero after the catch if he's got to 
break tackles and make things happen. Uh, but when you watch Quentin Johnston, Quentin Johnston's really getting after it. I mean, he, he's not only elusive, but he, he will break a tackle. So in one sense, you have one trait that you want to see more competitiveness and you want to see the ability to, to understand body positioning and really fight like hell for the football. But he does that once the ball's in his hand. So, you know, you can ding him for one, but you have to give him a big plus for the other one because both of them are, are very important at, at his position. Any center worth the squeeze in, in round one, or is that a spot that you would prefer to attack later on in the draft if you're Giants? I mean, listen, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge – yeah, I, I like John Michael Schmitz a lot from, from Minnesota. He knows who he is. He knows what he does. I think he's stronger than people think. I think he's a guy who can play not just outside zone stuff, but can fit into any kind of running scheme you want. I think Joe Tippman is solid out of Ohio State, uh, but probably I would wait until – I mean, Wisconsin, but I would wait until the second round. I like Whipler's fine from Ohio State. I, I'm, I'm fine with Whipler, probably um, third round, probably later third round. So it could be a consideration there. And then Ricky Stromberg to me is a kind of a discount version of center where you can go find a guy who doesn't necessarily always look the part and can look a little sloppy, but he gets guys blocked and he's more athletic than people think. And that's probably more like a fourth round center out of Arkansas. So for me, I think Schmitz went in Cody Mock. If you know, Cody Mock is a guy that some people um, consider a center. He played tackle at North Dakota State. He's got short arms. I'd like to see him bend a little bit better if he's going to be an interior player. But he could actually be a guy that a team could surprise you with, even, even the Giants, who might surprise you and say, you know what, we want a little attitude. Um, he is kind of reminiscent of Ryan Jensen from – you know, the way he plays and the toughness he approaches a position with. So he could be one of those surprise picks at the back end of one. He wouldn't be for me necessarily, but I could see him sneaking in somewhere with somebody who just loves the, the mindset and thinks that he's going to be a longtime starter. So um, I probably wouldn't draft center in the first round, but if you did, for me, I would take John Michael Schmitz out of Minnesota. Corners, top four, I feel like they've become somewhat – widely agreed upon and i'm curious to see if you agree with that uh you have gonzalez uh -huh. in whatever order you want to put him in gonzalez porter witherspoon and banks do you think any of those four get to the giants at 25 and if they don't is there anyone else you think still on your corner board that's worth the pick at 25 <laughs> or would you just wait at that point no i i i think all four of those guys are going to be gone i think the top two corners will be gone um Inside of the top, probably 11 picks. I think there's a yep. chance you might see Witherspoon slide to maybe 13, um, 14 at the latest. I think Gonzalez ends up going first to Atlanta. Um, Witherspoon, I think, needs to go, you know, Detroit, or he could slip just a little bit. Not a lot, but just a little bit. Um, you know, after that, you have, I think, Deont Deontay Banks is going to be the next guy that comes off the board. And he's just such an explosive tester. Those guys get pushed up. And then Joey Porter, for me, is going to be – I had him going 24th, but I think he'll be the fourth corner um, after that. And then it gets kind of interesting because DJ Turner, I think he's got some really good tape. He's fast. Uh, he's tough. I think he can carry more weight. I talked to a strength coach, and he can carry more weight than he's listed at, at, at 179. But, I, you know, I'm a fan of what – got some of the same things that I saw from uh, – in terms of his mirror and match from uh, Tredavious White when he came out of LSU. I don't think people talk about DJ. Uh, I don't think they talk about DJ enough. I think they should talk about him more. I talked to an NFL team and asked, do you think he could sneak into the first round? And they thought about it and I said, yeah, you know what? There's a chance that he could sneak in there. So, but it, it's, I think the opinions of these cornerbacks is going to get pretty varied once you get outside of the top four. I think it's going to, really really very based on scheme fit so you know because of that i think teams will be a little more hesitant to pull the trigger on cornerback but i i could see the giants i mean depending on what the giants like and what what they're going to covet there's some speed guys there's some longer guys but i think round two for me with when day two with guys like terrell smith from minnesota who i'm a fan of i mean You've got some. You've got some other corners uh, later in the draft that I think are are, are value picks too. But um, 
I just I don't think you're going to have the value at cornerback. So when I looked at the board, and I consider that, but when I saw Brian Branch sitting there, I said, wow, I've got somebody who can play some nickel, and I've got somebody who can fit the safety role. I mean, I'll help out the secondary by – by taking branch and I'm not going to, you know, try to push it with the fifth cornerback off the board. Yeah. Give me like two or three favorite day, two or three corners lands that you think really fits into that press man, wink Martindale, get in your face, play a lot of man to man defense type of system. Uh, let's see. I'll pull some up here. You said day two, you think uh, yeah, day two or, or even like round four, if you think, because I know it's a really deep yeah. class. Well, so, I think Emmanuel Forbes, if you're okay with how thin he is, he's rail thin. He can do it. Terrell Smith out of Minnesota, um, I think, can absolutely do that. Uh, Juju Brents from Kansas State, all three of those guys. And Juju Brents is going to go ahead of, I think, Forbes and Smith. So wow. Julius Brents, Emmanuel Forbes, Terrell Smith. Cam Smith's got some character stuff, but it'll be interesting. They may pass on him. And a guy that's actually getting kind of hot right now, I think in the process is uh, Tyreek Stevenson. I don't know if the Giants, everyone seems to be bringing him in for a, a private 30 visit. And uh, Tyreek Stevenson from Miami is another one with size. Who's a press only corner. You, you can't play him off. You got to press, but he's somebody with some press too. Um, and then finally, Corey Trice, not real physical, but he is six, three, He's long. He's an incredible tester. Great short area quickness for being six foot three. So he's somebody that you might see going round three or round four who could also fit that role. So there actually is a decent amount of cornerbacks with some size in this year's draft. That's that's um, if you want some press man corners, Garrett Williams out of Syracuse. You you've got a pretty good selection once you get out of the first round. You have a great article up talking about position group strength in the draft on NFL.com, Lance. And you mentioned you think into your defensive line, and I'll quote you here, there is enough depth here for teams to find potential future starters on day three, rounds four through mm -hmm. seven. Well, after Dexter Lawrence, the Giants don't have Leonard Williams under contract after this year. So they're going to have to fill that out a little bit. Their run defense last year was pretty poor. So who are some of these interior defensive linemen on day three that have you excited that you think can be future starters? Well, I think Jacqueline Roy could slip out of the top 100 picks and could end up early day four. I mean, early day three in the fourth round. And uh, he's a defensive tackle out of LSU. That would be one. Zach Pickens, South Carolina. Um, I, you know, I'm still at the point now where I think Zach Pickens may end up going in the third round. So he may not slip quite that far. Cameron Young from Mississippi State is going to be there on day four, I believe. And uh, he's a player that I think can eventually – become a future starter. Uh, Keandre Coburn from University of Texas is a space eater who's got some ability to uh, fit into the rotation, and maybe become a future starter as well. Uh, there's going to be Broderick Washington out of Western Kentucky, more like a fifth rounder, but he's got some good upside. DJ Dale out of Alabama. There's another one from the Nick Saban tree that Dayball would probably uh, consider. And um, hmm, let's see. Oh, there's a player I really like named Kobe Turner. He's not the biggest guy, 6'2 and about 290, but Kobe Turner is someone out of Wake Forest that is a real playmaker. He's very, very tough and strong, one of the strongest pound-for-pound -pound players in the draft at defensive tackle. So if you're okay with a little bit undersized next to a space eater, he's the type of guy that you can find in uh, day three who I think is going to really surprise some people. I have two more positions, Lance. One quick follow-up on a player that I think we're kind of on the same page on and that's Kalaja Kansi out of Pittsburgh because I watch his tape and I say, wow, he's quick off the line. He gets a lot of penetration in the backfield, but it's almost always using his quickness, a lot of swim moves, a lot of overs, things like that. He uses the edge. I just, and, and I hate the Aaron Donald comparison. It's so lazy because when you watch Aaron Donald, it's, you know, it's great hand usage, it's power, it's strength. And you don't really see Kansi win with power much at all. And he's not, just if you put them side by side, what they look like at the combine, it's, it's like you're looking at two different almost species of people. Donald was so much mm -hmm. more rocked up than Cansey, right? So I guess my question for you is that, is Cansey going to be just a, a, a second and third down designated pass rusher? Is he going to be able to develop into a three down lineman? And, and how do you think teams are, are going to view him versus even a guy like Adabari, who's also undersized, but I think is a much different type of body than Cansey is? Well, so I think Atabari's not in the same class as Kansi. To me, Kansi's a much 
better player. The physical, the body type stuff, Adebari's got him beat. But really, the Aaron Donald stuff was stupid when Ed Oliver got it, and it's stupid yeah. right now with Kalaj Kansi. Kalaj Kansi's comp is Ed Oliver. That's a much better comp. Yep. I mean, they have very, very similar sizes. Really, the only thing that's different to me is Ed Oliver had over 32-inch arms, and 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 Kansi has under 31-inch arms, but he's so quick off the snap that hit the arm length, you know, people aren't getting into him first anyway. So it, it doesn't really, it doesn't really play into it for me. I think if you sit around, if you spend too much time talking about your issues with Cancy and what you think he can't do and what his concerns are, you end up missing out on what he can do and what he does. And I think people are going to talk themselves into, well, but you know, we can't, Hey, if you don't play him on first down, I mean, I think you hit it. What you do is you need to have somebody, you need to have some players who have some size in front of them. He doesn't play on early downs and you get somebody behind the stick, second and 10, second, and nine, second, and eight, he's running on the field. And we're immediately going to give you problems because Kalijah Kansi is going to have some, I mean, he's going to have some feast or famine snaps. There's no question if they catch him clean, He's in trouble, but if you don't, he's going to make plays in, in your backfield. He's going to wreck blocking schemes. And I think when you look at the amount, you know, once again, now now I'm going to shift over to baseball. If you look at the amount of home runs he can hit versus the strikeouts, I'm willing to live with some strikeouts because the home runs he hits are going to be significant in terms of, you know, getting in the backfield for tackles for losses, pressuring the pocket from the interior, which is so very valuable in the NFL. So I don't really. Honestly, I mean, yeah, you have to have a plan for him, and and I don't think it includes being a a full time every down player all the time. You may get to a point where eventually he can, as long as you're in the right kind of one gapping scheme, and and you probably play him at three technique, or maybe you play him on the nose, tilted nose, and you just let him just try to wreak havoc up front. Uh, so you you need to have an idea and a plan for him. But once you do, and once you put him in a good position he's going to be too quick for guards to block frequently and and some centers as well. So I think he's, I think the juice, the juice is worth the squeeze on that one. And uh, I think there's value. You just, if you need a starting three technique or a nose and you say, man, we really need a starting defensive tackle. Listen, he's going to be the, the exhaust or he's going to be the nitrous that you add to the, to the race car. He is, he's an, an accessory that you add that adds more performance to your defense. That's what he is. Yeah. Put him next to Dexter Lawrence. That, that could be kind of scary. To oh, be, absolutely. Quite honest with you. I think that's actually a pretty good fit. And you're right on tape. Like these guards can't even get two hands on him and he's already, you know, past their shoulder and, and he's right. basically cleared him. It's unbelievable. I'm with you. I think that's fair. All right. Last two positions, Lance, we appreciate the time. This has been great edge. Uh, you write in your position article. If you want one, get one before 75, but there's going to be a lot of them before 75 here. So what do you think the sweet spot is? Can the Giants get a good one at 25? You know, Murphy, does he get there? Do you like a B.J. Ojolari that early? Or do you think that's more of like a pick a guy in the 50s because there's so many of them in that area, you'll, you'll get a good one in round two? Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I would look at, I don't know if it's a Giant style, but Will McDonald is a guy that I think you might be able to, 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 to get him to play a little bit of off-ball linebacker uh, potentially in the future. Uh, it's not it's not the cleanest fit in the world, but both Ojolari for me, I would not touch him at 25. I think Will McDonald will eventually go in the first round when it's all said and done. But once you get to 25, Miles Murphy could be there. Uh, Keon White could be there. Keon White is more for me like a three four five technique. Yeah, five tech, think, right? Yeah, I think so. But you know, he can play. I mean, he's a very athletic. He has the athletic profile of a defensive end. He just I don't love him from a run defense standpoint, his instincts. He just kind of loses track of the football. But, boy, he is a big, strong guy. I think Tuli uh, Tui Pelotu from USC is a player that really needs a little bit more attention. He makes a lot of plays on defense. He's very smooth dropping in space. He, you know, is he does have some, some rush talent. Is he going to be – a double-digit sack guy. I don't know if he's going to be double-digit sack, but I love that he can play some hybrid stuff, that he can stand up and rush in the A-gap, the B-gap. You can move him around if you have a defensive front that you really want to maneuver all over the place. Derek Hall is the type of guy that I think fits what you're talking about, and Isaiah Foskey. Those are guys in the second round 
that I think have maybe a little more value than B.J. Ojolari. I think they're going to end up being um, a little better players. And then if you want to wait until the third round, maybe even the fourth round, Isaiah McGuire is a bigger, longer defense vent from Missouri at about 270 pounds. And then uh, uh, K.J. Henry has a little bit more athletic, uh, athletic ability. He's got a little juice and a little get off and people don't really talk about him, but it's funny NFL teams. I talk to, they like the athletic profile uh, from KJ Henry out of Clemson. So those are, those are just some of the guys that I might look at afterwards, but I mean, it keeps going. It just depends on what your what front you're running. Mike Morris out of Michigan has some upside. He's still learning to play the position. Um, DJ Johnson out of Oregon you know, is a very, very explosive and powerful end. It's just kind of what you're looking for on your particular defense. Because I can give you some big, strong guys. I can give you some explosive ones. I can give you guys with rush that may be a little undersized. But you can find some, you can find some ends in this draft. There's, there's, there's going to be some help. All right, final question real quick. Surprise, I saw running back as your ninth deepest position in this draft. But then I read the explanation and I thought about it. I'm like, you know what? Lance has a point. Because there are a lot of running backs that I really like in this draft, Lance, but I don't think there are many, aside from maybe a B. John Robinson, a Zach Charbonnet, that you would mm-hmm. say, all right, you're my workhorse, and not that the NFL teams really do this anymore anyway, right? And and, and you're going to run it 18, 20 times a game. But I do think if you're looking for role players at running back, whether it's a two-down guy like a Roshan Johnson or a third-down guy like a Ty J. Spears that can really impact the game, I think you can get him into the fifth round in this draft, don't you? Yeah, I do. And number one, it's we all we, we all know the position has been devalued. But the other thing is, you look at where Damian Spears, Damian Pierce went last year out of Florida. He was early in the fourth round. The Texans grabbed him. He had some really terrific tape. Yeah. Um, did not have heavy workload, so you know that was a big bonus going for him as well. And he went early in the fourth round. I think Israel Abinaconda from Pitt is somebody to really keep your eye on. I think this is a guy who. Is going to surprise a lot of people. He's very fast. He's very explosive. Can hit some real home, you know, can be a real home run hitter. He's got to keep an eye on. Zach Evans has some some character stuff in his background, which could cause him to fall. But he is he is big and physical and fast. And so he's another guy that, you know, I, I think in most drafts he would be second round. But I'm curious to see where he goes uh, in this year's draft. You mentioned Charbonnet is, is a guy who has some workhorse potential to him kind of you know I mean you just he he needs to be in a very specific offense so he needs to be I think in a downhill dotted eye formation where he gets to get the legs going I don't think you want him in a lot of shotgun stuff playing offset because it doesn't allow him to get the legs going downhill Tank Bigsby running back out of out of uh, Auburn who people do not I don't think they talk enough about Tank Bigsby either he's got some power and he's got some elusiveness and then you have, you know, Kendra Miller, I'm not as big on TCU, but there are people who really, really like him. Um, Roshan, as you mentioned, has some some workhorse to him. But there are guys like Dwayne McBride from UAB who are really, really talented. Muhammad Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim, who is as physical as they come. You watch the game in 2021, what he did to Ohio State before he tore his ACL, wow. And then you look at him this year, they would give the ball to him 30 times and he didn't even blink. Just miss, just that Minnesota would just pound on people, pound on people. I mean, he'd be a great one for the Giants. You say, okay, we're going to take out Saquon, and now we're coming at you with Ibrahim, who we get in the fifth round, and we're just going to batter you now in the fourth quarter. Um, I, I think that's the kind of guy you kind of, you know, you kind of like. But then Tajay Spears, as you mentioned, you know, Tajay Spears to me has that. If your guy goes out, Tajay Spears is now all of a sudden taking twenty, you know, getting seventeen to twenty carries a game, and he's not even. He's not blinking. I mean, he's he can handle that just fine. And then if you want, you know, Jameer Gibbs gives you matchup issues. If you want to really, he's kind of like the Kalijah Cansey of the offense. He is going to supercharge your offense. Uh, Devon A. Chain has some of the same things out of Texas A&M. I think he'll be available either uh, late third or even into the fourth round. So, uh, and Deuce Vaughn. Deuce Vaughn, you're going to be able to get sometime in the fifth or sixth round because of the size. And <laughs> He's small, but he's as tough as they come, and he's really, really versatile as well. So it's a fun wide receiver. It's a fun, fun running back draft. It's just kind of a niche running back draft. I don't see big time number one dudes in it, but I see, I see some guys who are really going to help you from a depth standpoint. 
Lance Zierl on NFL.com. Watch him on the NFL Network. Listen to him on Prospect the Pros with Dane Brugler on the Athletic. Dane's in front of the program, Lance. Really appreciate the time. I know you went a little bit longer than I promised. I apologize for that. Hope I didn't kill nah, you. You're good. Uh, enjoy your final <laughs> three weeks leading up to the draft, man. It, it's a blast. Enjoy your work a whole lot. We'll talk to you soon, all right? Okay, appreciate it. Thanks, man. Lance Zierlein joining us on the John Soto Podcast. We'll see you next time.